Even on the heels of an emergency ban, Standard continues to be a dumpster fire, and Omnath is a big part of that. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today to talk about Standard and Omnath's impact on Standard overall, what's going on with it. I'll be real, man. I just feel like we're almost locked into this endless cycle. I hadn't thought about it for the last however many number of days because in all honesty, what was going on with the Walking Dead secret layer has been this big sort of thing that ballooned out into all kinds of discussions, which I enjoyed, but ultimately eclipsed what's going on in standard for me. So turning my eye back to what's going on there, it's absolutely egregious, right? Let's look at the reality of the situation. Directly after Zendikar Rising was released, and I mean like, right on the heels of Zendikar getting released, Wizards of the Coast came out and did an emergency banning, right? They kicked Uro out of the format. They're just like, oh, he, we just, I guess, kind of noticed now that he needs to go. But at the same time, in the, in, in the announcement they made, the language said like, uh, well, you know, we had been showing signs of being a problem before. And it's like, everybody knows, man. We're doing this same dance over and over. Maybe it's just hitting home now because it feels like this has been going on like steadily without fail since the days of Oko. And Oko was in Throne of Eldraine. Throne of Eldraine was last year's like late year release that starts the rotation. So we've had a full year pass now where it feels like Standard is constantly bursting into flames. And then Wizards comes over with a bucket of water, and then they dump the bucket, and it's either empty or just full of paper, and the fire just gets bigger. That's what it feels like. It's just, the, the answers are insufficient in terms of quashing problems for the format, and it just feels like overall it's indicative of just the nature of magic design. So, like, when it comes to Omnath specifically here, I loved Omnath when he first showed up, right? He was he was my boy. He was just this mono green sort of, I'll keep your mana in the mana pool and I'll get beefier because of it. He didn't feel like, he felt good, but he didn't feel busted and dumb. Now, they are doing something cool conceptually with Omnath, where they keep adding different colors to him. So he's an elemental that keeps aligning with more elements, which is really, really cool conceptually, right? But then you come to the abomination, or I guess joyful toy, depending on your perspective, but from the perspective of a balanced format, Omnath Locus of Creation is an abomination. The card is simply too good. Look at what you get. First of all, it's four mana. It only costs four mana for a four four. And it feels weird saying it only costs four mana while fully acknowledging that it's four different colors of mana. That should be a much bigger stumbling block than it is. That is part of just the nature of mana accessibility and ramp in the current state of standard Magic the Gathering. Being able to consistently and easily cast a creature that is spread across four different colors, thats this is a genuine problem, right? This is not how things should be. Wizards of the Coast has said in the past problems with including all kinds of fetch lands and stuff like that is they don't want the format to turn into basically like five color good stuff where everybody just plays everything and the, the colors of the game really have no identity. It doesn't really matter. And everybody just, it turned, the, the easier it is to play all the colors and mash everything together, the more homogenous the format's gonna become as everybody gravitates to, why wouldn't I use all the best tools at my disposal? You know what I mean? So the fact that you can cast this Omnath at all to begin with is a real problem. Like, this should be a big hoop to jump through, and it's not. 
So we already start with something that where the casting cost on the surface makes you go, there's some difficulty there, but in reality, isn't nearly as difficult as you would think, right? So you've got a four, four for four mana. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card. That means any kind of answer to it that's not literally a counterspell to stop it from hitting doesn't end up getting you anywhere because your opponent gets to draw. Like, basically, if I play a destruction spell on Omnath after you've already got him out, you've already drawn a card to replace him. You're not behind. I am. It cost me a card, but it didn't cost you a card because you've replaced your Omnath right? So already that's really solid. But where it gets really out of control is the triple landfall ability. So it says whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain four life. It's if it's the first time this ability has resolved this turn, right? So it's each time you play a land, it's going to have a different effect, three different effects. The first is just to give you four life. Now that's a significant chunk of life, but at the same time, have to acknowledge that life gain in magic isn't that big a deal, simply because it's pretty easy to do damage. Now, obviously, repeatable life gain for life every turn can be fairly excessive, but on its own, when removed from the rest of the abilities and just used as just life gain, like if Omnath was just, hey, when you lay a land for the first time each turn, gain four life, you'd be like, all right, that's decent. I mean, honestly, at a mythic at that mana cost, you're going to expect more. I'll be real. But I'm just saying, from a balance perspective, the life gain isn't too much of a problem. But the fact that it's essentially just tacked on and icing on the cake for the other abilities is where things get gross. And to me, the second ability is really the absolute most crazy one, where the second land that you resolve putting into play and having this trigger goes off equals getting back red, green, white, and blue mana. You get four mana of those four colors. So if it basically, if you play Omnath and then manage to lay two lands, he was free. He didn't cost you anything, right? And this is, a, this is something we run into time and again with Magic the Gathering where making spells free, making things like messing around with casting costs and stuff like that is a problem. We saw it with crazy cards like Fires of Invention, although with some of the other insane stuff we've seen, Fires of Invention feels crazy, but not the craziest. But either way, through all Magic's history, free things are a problem. This is essentially free as long as you have a method of putting out a second land on top of being free, it will generate additional resources going forwards very easily and cheaply, right? Like it's not difficult to lay lands in this environment. We have multiple lands in the format that literally tap to sacrifice and get you another land. So that's two land drops from just your regular land drop without even needing to use spells accessible to every color. Then add in the fact that there's a ton of ramp, a ton of ways to get lands. Then add in the fact that there are also now spells that function as lands as well. So you can either cast it as a spell or as a land, and they're not just uncommon jank spells. We've got rares and mythics that are like that as well. So making these land drops is actually, it's really easy to do. It's not, it's not nearly as big a hoop to jump through as it appears on the surface. And to compound the problem, that's not all Omnath does. If you lay a third land, then he does four damage to each opponent and each Planeswalker you don't control. Now the language on this clearly says, hey, look at me. I meant for commander players, really. You know what I mean? Like the power level's pushed, but this is every opponent and Planeswalker you don't control, not just one opponent, right? So it's not really meant for one-on-one -on -one play. This is part of the fire design, right? And it's it's so aptly named because it's literally set standard on fire since they've started it. The idea is like they want to make more exciting, enticing cards. And the reason that they want to do this is they want the sets to sell well. They want the worlds to do well because for us to return to worlds, those worlds have to sell well the first time around. That's why there are a bunch of worlds that people love 
like Kamigawa that we will never return to. Although Kamigawa has additional reasons we won't return to it, but we won't get into those because that's not part of the conversation. The point is, is that they're aware there when they're designing cards that, hey, if we don't have a certain level of power and this set doesn't pop, we're never going to get to go back to this world. But that's just like while that statement is true, it's used to justify this approach where they design cards that are incredibly powerful, don't test them very much, and just release them into standard with the intention of them reaching out beyond the standard format. Before this fire design philosophy came along, the normal organic way for cards to find their way into other formats was just to be printed into standard and then, okay, you know what, they'll just kind of find their way into these decks, but standard will be balanced first. So we'll create a balanced standard environment. And then if things make it to other formats and people want to enjoy that, cool, that's a nice little side bonus. But that became the main target, it seems like, where if it's not the main target, I'm genuinely surprised. But it does feel like the main target is actually don't make cards for standard specifically. Make cards for other formats and we'll just put them into standard. And we will just keep slapping band-aids on the formats in the, fa in the form of bands or outright changing how things function like they did with the companions, right? Where they weren't willing to ban that entire class of new cards. So they literally just changed how the ability functioned. They weakened it considerably. And that is something that normally doesn't happen in Magic. And this has all happened in the span of the last year, right? So Omnath was designed to entice commander players. And yet here it is obliterating standard to the point where they felt the need to issue a banning to try and nerf the power level. They said, okay, Uro is too good in this deck as well as everything else, even though he's just amazing on his own. Let's ban him and hopefully that will take the power level of the Omnath deck down without us having to touch anything that's in print. Because their current philosophy appears to be make cards, if they're a problem, it doesn't matter, we'll ban them far enough down the line that it's not the main set we're selling. So it seems like they want to wait at least a couple of sets before banning a card from that set. So for Omnath to see a ban, we're honestly probably going to have to wait until after Kaldheim has like fully cycled in and we're on the verge of looking at Strixhaven. Honestly, that my genuine belief is that Omnath is going to be a dominant force and I can't see how Kaldheim won't most likely make the situation worse as it's just going to put more tools in the deck's toolbox. So unless something else, like here's the thing, Omnath is going to become stronger from Kaldheim or something more broken is going to come along and supplant the deck. Those are the two scenarios I envision. Those aren't pleasant scenarios. It is becoming incredibly tiresome to have this scenario where standard is always broken and it seems like they don't care and the language they use in the announcement sometimes is almost accusatory towards us where it's like this is all our fault but it really does feel like they've changed their focus and maybe even pulled manpower away from certain things like testing just seems to be a thing of the past. Playtesting is just like, will this card function within the rules? And then even that, even, even with that, look at Mutate and what's happened with Mutate and what a debacle that was. So it genuinely feels like it's like, just make magic cards. We don't really need to test them. We'll just make them and put them out there. And if the players are upset, oh, well, we've got their money. That's really what it feels like overall standards philosophy is oh well we've got their money they'll yell they'll complain and once this thing isn't selling once whatever six months down the road we think we can't milk any more money out of selling the boxes it's in then and that's, that's when we'll ban it and it's just this is a fraud like dude i play on arena like every day right this isn't just some random complaint about something i don't engage with whatsoever i play magic a lot right like i play every day so i see what happens and it's frustrating to deal with this like i i don't even want anything to do with hardcore competitive standard because it just it's 
Unfortunately, under the best of circumstances, it can feel pretty repetitive. But when it's broken like this, it's just absolutely unfun. I don't know. I just wanted to talk about that, share my frustration. I'm not the only one. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people talking about this. It's clearly unacceptable the way that they're currently governing standard. And I genuinely look forward to a course correction on that at some point and then to wake up and go, you know what, let's make this format more playable. Because honestly, like that's what keeps arena moving forwards. And you can't completely like abandon balancing standard and expect people to play a broken game. You know what I mean? Like people who really like magic will find other ways to play it but you're cutting off your influx of new players, or at least choking it off to a degree, which is not wise for a business to be doing. Let me know your thoughts, guys, in the comments below. If you like what I'm doing here, like, comment, subscribe. I appreciate all of it. It's all great for the channel. If you love what I'm doing, jump on my Patreon. And my friends, I bid you adieu. I will leave a lore video up here beside me on the screen. Click on that watch some awesome magic lore because you deserve it.